In the fallout of one of the most volatile American elections ever, financial markets did something very strange. They rose, and rose to new record levels again. This would be unusual during even a normal election, where most investors tend to sit back and wait for the dust to settle, but it is especially strange in 2020. Joe Biden, who everybody is at least 90% confident will be the next president, has spoken very openly about plans to raise corporate taxes, and this is coming in conjunction with tensions around how a transition of power may or may not take place. Not to mention that global pandemic. If investors are supposed to fear uncertainty, surely they would be terrified of the current world that we live in. Logic would dictate that the best outcome for the major corporations that make up financial markets would have been a nice, simple, and decisive Republican victory. At the end of the day, they tend to be slightly more pro-business. Instead, what they got was an extremely contentious Democratic victory with the potential to bring turbulence around key issues like COVID relief packages in the coming months. So what is going on here? Why have markets rallied so hard in spite of all of this turbulence? Will this market boom reverse if the proposed policies of the Biden campaign are actually rolled out? And could it be that investors just no longer favoured Trump as president? Now this is becoming a bit of a common trend, but big disclaimer time. Since this video will be looking at the market rally in the context of the election, we need to note that we are not politically advocating for one party or another. Everything over there in America land looks all kinds of crazy, and we do not want to get involved at all. We will be here to comment on the economic fallout though. This episode of Economics Explained is brought to you by Trends. If you're a hustling entrepreneur, investor, or are thinking about starting your own business, you are absolutely going to love Trends. Their platform provides you with exclusive access to a massive content library with articles on all the latest trending topics, like this article about the rise of modular homes or how to capitalise on the looming skilled trade shortage. If reading isn't your thing, Trends also offers a video library with Q&As hosted by industry thought leaders like how to make an app if you don't know how to write code, or how to grow your startup 20-fold using TikTok, and much more. Try out Trends for two full weeks, all for just $1, by going to trends.co slash ee. The link is on the screen now and in the video description below. Now this is actually the third time we have explored a similar market rally on the channel before, but we will be looking at a completely different set of contributing factors this time around. Even still, those other two videos are no less relevant, so if you are interested in this topic, go and check out those videos there as well. But in brief, some major contributing factors are a lot of money being pumped into the system through quantitative easing from the Federal Reserve, creating an environment where people have a decent amount of cash. This combined with record low interest rates means that people don't have anywhere to keep their cash other than in the stock market where even if they only get a 4 or 5% return, it's better than the 0% that they would get in a bank. The other big reason we explored previously were that foreign investors were moving their money into the US market, which has historically been perceived as a large, stable safe house during times of economic turbulence in the world. Now both of these factors are still true to a certain extent, but much less so now than they were earlier in the year. Government stimulus has slowed down massively and was ground to a halt prior to the election by the Senate being dismissed. This is the main channel by which that money printing done by the Federal Reserve gets out there into the world. What's more is that America is no longer that same safe house it was for international investors. The turbulence around the election as well as the swelling infection rates across the nation mean that a lot of international institutions and individuals are instead preferring to invest in their own countries which have comparatively fared a lot better. The international community might also be able to pull some influence in a way that people often forget, their variable buying power. Since the start of the pandemic, the American dollar has dropped significantly compared to other world reserve currencies like the Euro, the Yen, and even the Australian dollar. This actually came following a huge spike in the value of US dollars during the initial crash. When exchange rates are considered, the S&P 500 is still comparatively below its all-time high earlier in the year. For example, I am an Australian that invests into American index funds using Australian dollars, and my portfolio is still comparatively worse off than it was at the beginning of the year. I know, boo hoo for me. But it also means that as I earn a salary in Australian dollars, I can buy more American shares with the same amount of cash, driving up prices. All of this is to say that these two factors tend to be what everyone points to to explain away the market rally, but if this really did explain everything, the new market high would certainly not have waited until now to show up. So what else is going on? Earlier this week, amidst all the chaos in the world, Pfizer announced that they had developed a vaccine with a 90% effectiveness in initial trials. 
This was great news and gave an indication to the world that this ordeal may soon be coming to an end. An end where life can go back to normal, where people can go out, go to work, go to dinner, go on holidays, all things that will breathe life back into businesses that have been hanging on by a thread. Now this is very good news, obviously, and we don't want to in any way diminish this impressive achievement by Pfizer and the wider medical research community, but the overwhelming message from professionals in the know is not to get overly excited about this news just yet. Medicine is a legendarily bureaucratic business. Any new product has to jump through an endless array of hoops before it is released to the general public, especially when it's a vaccine, which has an even higher set of standards of testing because it is given to healthy people rather than to people that are already sick. Now, given the potential benefits, Pfizer is in talks with the FDA to fast track this process, cutting it down from something that would have normally taken years to something that could be rolled out within a few months. But for this to be approved, there can be absolutely no signs of any complications. Even still, sometimes just the glimmer of hope is enough for investors to think that other investors are going to get into the market, and so they get into the market to try and beat out those other investors, and so on and so forth until the type of reaction you would expect from good news is achieved, even if the good news wasn't that great. This is one of the key cognitive biases that is taught to most professional investors working for large institutions. The bandwagon bias means that people will look at the money that they stand to make, jump in safe in the comfort that there will be some greater fool following along. As for genuine long-term outlook, if this breakthrough is real and remains on schedule for public distribution, it would lead to a significant boost to the fundamentals of companies that have been impacted by this health crisis. Airlines could fly again, cruise ships could cruise again, and shopping malls could go back to being packed out war zones on a Sunday afternoon. You know, like the good old days. The thing is though, these aren't the stocks that have been doing well during this price boom. Retail and transport have done well since the news broke, but have been outperformed even still by technology companies. Now this is especially weird because technology companies haven't been too badly affected by the new world that we are living in. In fact, some of them have benefited greatly from online shopping, home deliveries, and business communication systems that have become a requirement rather than a luxury. So why would these businesses be doing better than the ones that really stand to gain from this good news? Well, perhaps this is a sign of a troubled road to recovery. There are a lot of businesses out there which are now almost exclusively reliant on government stimulus to remain alive. Mostly the businesses that we were looking at earlier, like retail, airlines and cruise lines. Given the turbulence surrounding the election, it is likely that any talks of continued stimulus are going to be pushed to the side in favour of arguing about the nuances of a broken election system. This means that these companies may very well fall into bankruptcy during this drawn out process, and even though the promise of a world back to normal may only be a few months away, it's no good to them when they are going into receivership now. Tech stocks by contrast are doing well now and will probably be doing better in a normal world with higher employment. This makes them a safer bet for future prosperity. Bill Ackman, a hedge fund manager who profited over $2.6 billion from a single trade that predicted the first market downturn, has announced earlier this week in an interview with the Financial Times that he has taken out similar positions again to bridge the credit gap of unstable businesses over the next 12 months. There is no point betting on what the biggest recovery winner will be if you aren't sure who is going to make it to that recovery phase. But for those who do, there was one other piece of good news that came out earlier last week. A landscape of gridlocked stability. Investors love one thing above all else, and that is certainty. Investors would rather know that the world is going to be hit by a giant asteroid for certain because they could invest in bunkers and canned food companies as opposed to only having a 50% chance of being hit by an asteroid because if the predictions don't come true then those bunkers and canned food reserves are not going to perform well on their portfolio. We saw a slightly less extreme version of this effect earlier in the year. When people were unsure about how bad the fallout of the coronavirus would get, they wanted to pull their money out of the market until they could pick and choose where and when to put it back in. As soon as the world realised that, oh yeah, this is bad, people begrudgingly reinvested just with the outlook of backing companies that would be able to weather the storm. Now, the future can never be 100% certain, but when the outcomes of big changes in the world are completely up in the air, most investors like to sit back and see how things play out before funneling all of their money into something, even if that means that they might miss out on huge speculative gains. Remember, this is investing, not gambling. Although, the line does sometimes get a bit blurred. Even still, you might say, well, that kind of uncertainty still exists, and well, yeah, that's true. 
But the election gave investors a much bigger gift than you might expect. A mixed government. Regardless of who was sitting in the Oval Office on the 21st of January, and again, I'm not getting into it, y'all be crazy, it doesn't really matter, because neither party will control the House and the Senate and the Presidency. This means that any laws or budgets that they want to get passed will either be rejected by one step of this process, or will need to be watered down to get the tick of approval from both parties. We went into a lot more detail as to how this works on our Trump vs Biden video, so go and watch that if you're interested in bureaucratic government processes. Now, while this outcome might be less than ideal for the political parties, it's great for investors. Biden's proposed tax plans will likely not make it through the Republican-controlled Senate without a lot of changes. Likewise, any plans to cut welfare spending or lower taxes further will not get through the Democratic-controlled House, so it pushes government policy changes into a bit of a stalemate, which is fantastic for investors for a few reasons. The companies they are investing in can work on the rules that exist in the world now and don't have to be ready to shift strategy at a moment's notice due to some major change in policy. It also means that investors can project growth over a longer term rather than trading on back and forth policy changes. There is a semi-humorous expression in institutional investing, don't change anything ever. At Economics Explained we might call it stability and confidence, but whatever you brand it there is one way to make sure that nothing changes ever and that's to try and get politicians to work on something together. All jokes aside, this is a signal that investors may be getting the best of both worlds. Overall, Donald Trump's impacts on the financial market have been overwhelmingly positive. Driven heavily by the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017, markets have grown steadily over his term as president, only really faltering twice. Once was the Christmas crash of 2018, which was a very short but severe downturn, which was eventually alleviated by strong consumer spending figures, and then the second wave was of course the market's reaction to the pandemic in early 2020. Having a pro-business government has, surprise surprise, been good for business. But it hasn't been perfect. Trade tensions have been a major concern for a lot of multinationals in recent years. Businesses have been hesitant to fine-tune supply chains, especially involving Mexico and China, out of fear that they will be hit with tariffs or be forced to reinvest into alternatives. Now while fiscal policy involves the cooperation of the legislative and executive branch of government, the President has a lot more direct control over trade through the Department of Commerce as well as having face time with other world leaders. One of Joe Biden's big contributions to the Obama administration was shaping foreign policy through trade. And throughout his campaign, he has maintained positive rhetoric around building these mutually beneficial connections. If businesses could be handed a future where they got to keep the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017 while having certainty around global supply chains and trade agreements, they would be very happy little jelly beans indeed. And with the current mixed government, it looks like that might be exactly what they're about to get. The idea that the markets are happy to see Trump go is pretty silly. Remember, four years ago his election drove a market rally for exactly the same reasons that we have explored many times on this channel, but as heartless as it sounds, it might just be that his usefulness has run its course. Big businesses have gone, tax cuts, you beauty, we will take that, huge private sector stimulus, don't mind if we do, and now they are ready for the dessert, which is healthy international trade in a world that might soon be back to normal. The market can remain irrational longer than rational investors can remain solvent. And who knows, by the time this video is made public the market could have dropped 10% or shot up by 10%, it really is anybody's guess at this point. There are so many technical factors mixed with human emotions that go into pricing a stock that it really is hard to explain from time to time. But even still, it is a great gauge on people's confidence in the world. People often joke that the stock market is just a chart of rich people's emotions, and as funny as that may sound, it's absolutely true. So if there's any takeaway from these new record highs, it's that something is going on that makes wealthy people happy. In the meantime, average Americans and citizens around the world can only hope that this is something that will make them happy as well. Now, understanding what it is that makes these influential people tick can be a difficult process, one that can be made a lot easier with trends. With a subscription to Trends, you will not only gain private access to the most valuable content library on the internet, one that may help you spark your next big idea, but also a like-minded community of CEOs, entrepreneurs and investors alike. 
I highly suggest checking out the events section so you can RSVP for digital Q&A sessions hosted by high achieving startup CEOs and industry thought leaders. These digital events provide a truly unique opportunity to ask smart people for their advice to help you build your own startup or anything else that your heart desires. After you've RSVP'd for a few events, be sure to head over to the Signals section. All the data and charts that you see are procured by the full-time team of analysts who work at Trends. Keep in mind, this data was previously only available to hedge funds and billion dollar consulting firms, all of which is included in your Trends subscription. Try it out for two weeks, all for just $1, by going to trends.co slash ee. Again, that's trends.co slash ee. The link is on the screen now and in the video description below. Thanks for watching guys, bye.